to the higher level podcast. So with everything going on at the moment, we thought we'd put a nice little bonus episode for you. Uh, so in this episode, we're going to discuss um, some of the UFC fighters that have come out of the higher level gym. And we're going to talk about their fights uh, in the UFC. Uh, so James, we're going, to, we're going to start off with Stevie Ray and uh, discussing his fights. Um, so Stevie, I'll just need to refer to my notes so I'll get them all right. Stevie debuted against uh, Marson uh, Bandel. Um, yep. That was his debut fight, a fight in which he won in round two. Um, so just want to talk a wee bit about that fight. Just first and foremost about leading into it, how Stevie's camp was leading into that fight. <laughs> uh, he never had a camp for that one. Uh, what happened was uh, Stevie was a cage warrior's uh, lightweight champion. He'd won a four-man tournament, uh, won the title, I think he lost it and then won it again against Kurt Warburton. Um, so he's, he's walking about as a champion and got a call and two weeks notice to go and uh, fight in UFC Poland against Marcin Bandel. So the big thing that, that, the big challenge we had with that was Stevie was very heavy. He was about, I think he ended up dropping 35 pounds in two weeks to make that fight. He was actually in, he was in Newcastle. We had fighters on our show down there and they, the fighters had won and the guys actually went out at night um, to celebrate and had a couple of drinks I think Stevie had a pizza and a kebab or whatever but they woke up the next day and it's like I've got this opportunity what should I do and I was like well we kind of have to take it um, so we pretty much got him back up the road to Newcastle and it was two weeks of just cardio and sparring um, trying to get the weight down but it was pretty much just a it was pretty much two weeks of weight loss eh? um, the we, we sparred for a week but he was doing just a lot of running and dieting he wasn't on a lot of calories and stuff so it wasn't like he, he trained the way you would, you would like him to train for it just get the weight down get the weight down get the weight down we actually took it thinking if you don't win the fight you've got a four fight contract we'll aim for that second one um, but within about two days my my mentality changed was it doesn't matter about the weight we're going to we're going to win the fight um, I'm trying to remember the only thing I remember with that is Stevie had, we'd looked into the guy a wee bit and we've got some Polish boys at trainways and they were all going on about how good this guy's grappling was he was, was yeah. a black belt Stevie was a purple belt at the time um, he'd won a lot of competitions good leg locker and stuff so Stevie had come in and he was like, I can't go to the ground with this guy. And he, I, what I remember most about it was just shooting that that down. It was just being like, I said, can you can you can see the range with the guy if you get into a fight thinking, I can't go to the ground with him. Before you know it, you're going to be on the ground with him. I was like, yeah. it's not a grappling competition. It's an MMA fight. Um, just go in, let's believe that we're better than the guy everywhere and just take him out and then if you watch the fight back, Stevie smashed him on the ground. Like he, he just, he, he just done him everywhere. So it was the first time I'd, it was the first time we'd went through that kind of process with him, where he was like, I can't go to the ground with this guy. And, and I think he took a lot of confidence for that fight. Um, cause even in the, in the build up and stuff, Dan Hardy was, was going about this guy, how he had rolled with him, and he's a submission specialist and stuff. And and I was just like, the, the whole time Stevie I was like, it doesn't matter if it goes to the ground. It's like you can hang with him, you can hang with right. any of these guys in every range. By the time you get to that level, you need to be able to hang with them every range. There's a part of it as well, once you're fighting at that level, it's about kind of proving to yourself that you belong at that level. Yep, definitely. I think it was, we used to always say it was easy, but, well, not easy, but to get into the UFC was, was hard, but staying there, um, especially the way Stevie has. He's, he's on his fourth contract now. Um, staying there is a, is a task in itself. You see, there's a lot of guys we know very good fighters for the UK have not made it past four fights or five fights. Um, so our goal was always to get in, get the win, and then it was always get to the next contract. Um, the same way yeah. with Danny as well. Yeah, and, and next up, Stevie uh, faced Leandro, Leandro Mafra again. 
Uh, Stevie came out with the victory in that fight in the first round. Just tells you a wee bit about uh, sort of preparation and game planning and the execution of everything in the fight. Yeah, this camp went a lot better. We had a we had like proper time to train for it. What I remember most about that was that we had more media uh, commitments because it was in Glasgow. It was the first time it came to Glasgow, so it was a bigger occasion. But he he dealt with the pressure really well. Um, Camp was good. We we stayed at home for this camp. Um, two things I remember most about that one was I knew that that he could counter Mafra with his hook. Uh, when when Mafra swings, he, he he pulls his head out, but doesn't he bring his guard or his feet with him? He leaves his feet in a bad spot. <laughs> and I knew that Stevie could let him throw and, and come over the top of that and catch him, which is ultimately how he kind of hurt him before he stopped him. The other thing I remember it was the first time. Uh, I spoke to a coach at TriStar and they had they had said that uh, Joe Duffy had been offered get, basically Joe Duffy got a, a list of five names and Mafra was on it and he ended up taking some he fought on the same night against some grappler some Brazilian grappler but it was the first time I'd seen that business side of it where I was like why is yeah. certain guys getting offered opponents when we were just getting told this is, this is who you're getting um, but getting it, it was it was a big night for Stevie. It was like main card at the at the hydro. Um, it was a nice knockout and stuff. It's it's full. It was, it was one of the kind of nights that you'll never forget. It type of thing. Yeah, and it's one of the nights where the it could be very easy for a fighter to let the occasion get to. Aye, uh, he 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 was brilliant that night. I think that was the, the one he got a bonus for as well. But. He was absolutely flying that night and the occasion probably lifted him that night uh, more than anything. I remember I remember him at the, the, the public weigh-in we're standing behind Mafia and, and Stevie's gone, he's, he's, he's massive, he's fucking massive. And I was like, it doesn't matter, he just, uh, he just looked puffed out and, and stuff like that. But he was perfect that night and it was, a, it was nice to win with stuff we'd been working on in the gym. Um, and, and a, a kind of gap that we'd seen in the guy's game. So it shows the game plan and does does benefit the fighter then. Yeah, yeah. I think that guy had done his camps at AKA as well, so he was he was coming out a good team. Yeah, yeah. And uh, obviously Stevie's third fight in the, Oct- the Octagon he came against uh, Michael LeBook. Michael LeBook maybe somebody that was a bit more familiar to you because he fought around the uh, did some fights in the UK as well. Um, again, Stevie, Stevie won that fight. Just talk us through again a wee bit about preparation, execution of game plan and performance. Uh, LeBou had actually fought in Glasgow and quite an exciting fight and we expected him, we expected a wee bit more for him actually in Dublin but he, he was quite negative that night. <coughs> um, it was, so Stevie had come off two stoppages uh, getting into that fight and LeBou kind of smartly just kind of kept, kept his distance he was a wee bit taller on Stevie and tried to play at range but Stevie got ahead and got a read on him pretty early and then he just it, he got comfortable do you know what I mean he was he was, he was winning one, one round it looked you could tell with, within about two minutes like Stevie's better than the guy um, if LeBou had actually tried to fight him Stevie could have probably finished him but it can be hard to finish guys who are, who are not trying to engage too much there's a yeah. bit in the fight, uh, I think it's near the end of round three, where you can see Stevie getting frustrated, where he picks him up and just kind of throws him at the mat. <laughs> um, but it was it, it was the first time, it, it was in a situation there where he was winning pretty comfortably. Um, it was 30 27 on all the scorecards. Um, if he took a risk, he may have got caught. We'll do some, some, some skills like, but it was professional. I just got the, got the job done in it. It meant they got to three and on the UFC, and it bumped him on his next contract, which, which was a uh, again our once one of our goals once we got there was to get to contract number two. So he went in with three wins, two stoppages, and he got like a, a decent kind of pay rise and stuff as well. Yeah, yeah, that's it. It's it's so difficult to get to that second contract, like you say. Uh, not many guys do it that go in through the promotion, but obviously Stevie got that. And then Stevie came up against Alan Patrick, which ultimately was going to be his first loss in the UFC. It was a unanimous decision loss. Yeah. Um, again, get, give me your thoughts on the, everything leading up to that fight and just how the fight played out. 
Uh, that fight was the camp was fine. Um, I think he'd done a wee bit of time at Tri Star for that. It was home. I think he'd done four weeks at home, Tri Star for five weeks, and then home for six, and then we went to Brazil for two weeks. Um, Patrick was, I think he was maybe 13, though, at the time, dangerous, kind of unorthodox guy. Um, the fight, what I remember of the fight was it was pretty close. Um, Stevie had some had some good minutes in it. He had a nice arm bar at one point. I think he heard the guy's arm popping. The Brazilian guy was for was never going to tap. Um, he took the guy's back at one point. He had the body try and go on um, with the arm trapped in, but he was on the he was on his back. Stevie was on his bad side. He struggles to finish on that side, but. It was one of those fights where there wasn't much in it. It was it was like a fight where if it wasn't a three five minute rounds and he just told the, the two guys to fight, Stevie would beat him um, yeah. and find a finish. Whereas Alan Patrick kind of edged the rounds by just taking Stevie down and, and lying on top of him. Um, there was a couple of wee bits like a couple of wee sequences went went the other way. Then Stevie could have won that fight, but it was a good fight. Um, against a, a dangerous guy a big big guy at the weight and, and stuff like that so it was a hard one to take obviously as his first loss but he, he wasn't outclassed or anything in that fight it was just a couple of wee a couple of wee sequences or he maybe steps one way a millimetre the other way or, or, or whatever or he'd got certain position a wee bit earlier in the round then and stuff would have been different yeah and then obviously coming, coming off that fight against Alan Patrick Stevie got probably what is uh, to that point was the biggest name of his career. Uh, he got a, an opportunity to fight Ross Pearson, a guy that was extremely well known, especially in the UK scene. So again, with that fight, just just talk us through everything leading up to that. Talk us through getting the the name Ross Pearson, and then ultimately the the fight itself. Had that one short notice as well. I think we, I think we had three and a half weeks or something for that. Um, Ross was co-main event in Belfast and his opponent pulled so when they came and asked it was one of those ones you didn't even have to think about um, well, definitely take it Steve was walking about light so there was no issue with, with making weight um, so it was a good opportunity and it was right back off that Alan Patrick loss so we were kind of planning on if we get this one it was against a bigger name it would kind of erase the loss a wee bit um, the camp was decent again we never had a lot of time what we've done with that was we brought in a, a pro boxer called Craig Dockery so a Commonwealth boxing champion um, similar size to Ross but much much better boxer he was an excellent yeah. pro boxer um, who'd, who'd actually fought MMA so Stevie was sparring 20 rounds with him our plan was to try and get or 20 rounds a week sorry our plan was to try and get 40 rounds in in this kind of three week period before we went and we managed to get them in um, the, the game plan for that fight was was not to engage in a in a kind of fight with Ross if you if you stand in boxing range and box it out with him he's, he's super dangerous um, and Stevie generally likes that type of fight so the, the plan and he, he stuck to the plan really well actually in this fight it was probably the most disciplined he's been in a game plan it was just to touch him and move away touch him and move away and, and get Ross frustrated and, and when Ross started opening up a wee bit Stevie could land um, and it was, it was it was a good thing with Stevie that night because he's fighting against type because if you, if you send Stevie in there he'll fight the way he did against Bandel and Maffrey he'll just go in and uh, he'll, he'll try and take them out like he, he yeah. quite likes that and there's been times where I've, I've had to ask him to do that but with this one it was a case of don't do what you want to do give me 15 minutes of, of moving and stick to the game plan because you're, you're now coming off a loss we're in a different position um, if you take if you take a win here against Ross Pearson it, it blows you up a wee bit at the time Ross was obviously still a massive name so he he, bought, he fought to instruction really well that night Um which was cool because um, it's not that hard to do especially when when the coach is asking you to, to go against your natural kind of instincts as a fighter Yeah that, like you say that was a, it was a big win for, for uh, Stevie but obviously Ross had been a uh, tough smash coach as well so that was 
very notable one then after the Ross fight the next name that comes to you is Joe Rose on who for me is a bigger name than Ross Pearson worldwide Ross is big in the UK but Joe Rose on uh, he's a veteran of the game he's been around the scene so tell, tell me what it was like when you got the name Joe Rose on uh, for Stevie it was exciting uh, once you start throwing names like that, like that you kind of know you're on the right path um, it was it was one of the fights I remember talking on Facebook about how it was it was my favourite fight to prepare for because I got to watch Joe Lowe's on fight yeah like, like every day um, he's one of the guys like he's there's about five six guys in the gym like that's my favourite fighter he's my favourite fighter um, and then you get to go and fight him so it was really cool um, decent camp again we 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 had a couple of strategies for it. We had a we, we could get uh, Joe into this defensive shell position where he plants his feet and lifts his hands dead high. Stevie could exploit yeah. it, which we did in the fight. Um, we also knew that he was super dangerous in the first round, which it turned out to be. Um, I think he took the first round ten eight. Um, so it was a weird one for me because it was the first time for the guy getting an absolute what doing. It was, it, and the Alan Patrick one, I always. There was always a hope there that Steve would get him. He was never getting beat up. Whereas in the Lozon fight, the first round he got he got absolutely dominated because um, he kept throwing kicks and and he was getting took down off the kick and then he just came in and again the, the first thing I'm saying is don't be throwing the kicks and whatever looks been start taking over now and he's adapted in round two, one round two, and then I think. Uh, you can see me in the if you watch the footage you can hear me in between round two and three you see me need need a big round here You're, you might be two rounds then um, but I kind of knew it was a 10-8 first round a 10-9 second round and Stevie's went out and uh, I think he won the last round 10-8 so he just put it on him but you can see you can see the bits in it where Stevie gets hit and then you can see him actually punching himself in the face. <laughs> like, like, can you say, right, let's, let's fucking go. And um, he, he just took over after that, getting that doing in first round. Eh? He knows he knows when he has to go. So that was one of the times where, when he could just fight the way he likes to fight, almost to a point where it, it, was, it could be reckless against some opponents. But at that stage in the fight, it was a perfect kind of way to go. But yeah, it's a massive, it, massive win. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it's like I say, Pearson was a really big win, but Lozon then takes you that further just because he's known by a wider audience of people. And then the next one you get is Paul Felder. At that time, I don't think as big a name as Lozon, eh, not what he is now, but very, very dangerous eh, opponent. So Stevie got up there, that was eh, Glasgow again. Yeah. One thing you did say about that fight is. Stevie actually liked Paul Felder. Um, so, so just talk us through the everything leading up to that fight and obviously how the fight went. Hey, we actually hung about with him quite a bit in Brazil. He fought Trinaldo in Brazil when Stevie fought and got beat. Um, but we, we kind of spent a bit of time with him and he's, he's, he's a very cool guy. Um, There's a couple of things with that fight. I don't think Stevie want really wanted to fight at that point but because it was in Glasgow he kind of felt like he had to um, and then you you were catching Paul Felder at a bad time as well I think he'd just lost his dad to cancer so I think he'd kind of he'd use that to kind of steal himself and, and motivate himself and he, he, can, he just came back he was a different animal with that focus and and stuff Um He's a dangerous guy as it is anyway, but when, when he's when he's coming in with something like that in his head and he's he's a double dangerous. But um the fight the fight obviously went how it went. Stevie made a, a mistake. He dropped his head pretty low in a, a grappling position on the fence, get get dropped with a knee. And then I don't know if he's been semi conscious on the ground, but if you watch the footage he actually goes to like a two in one grip, which is a jiu jitsu grip. And it's left Paul's other arm completely free to drop elbows in his head. Eh? So he's been stopped quite early in the first round. I think he'd cut Felder because I've got a video on my phone of the two of them getting stitches um, backstage and, and just talking away at each other. Like, But they, they, 
it's one of those things you, the guys know what they're signing up for but it was the first time Stevie's actually fought somebody that he's like I like this guy and I think he'd been reading interviews about, about Felder's situation with his dad and stuff and and uh, it, it kind of affected him a wee bit but I think Steve had quite a lot going on outside the gym at that point and it was just he was going through the motions a wee bit in the gym um, we'd, we'd got some good sparring and stuff for that we'd, we'd brought in Chris Shaw and uh, we'd brought in a, kid, a Polish kid for Edinburgh who was pretty good um, but it, it was just one of those things I think if, he'd, if it wasn't in Glasgow he maybe not maybe not made it to the fight but yeah you don't get the chance to fight in the hydro all the time. Yeah, that's it. That's well. Uh, that's exactly that. And it was a tough fight, and obviously it must have been a tough loss for Stevie that one. Um, next up, he was scheduled against uh, Kyan Johnson. This is probably for me as as a fan of Stevie's probably the most frustrating fight I'd seen in terms of the decision. So, g- give me your thoughts on the the fight with Kyan Johnson and. Ultimately, what you thought about how the, the judges scored that fight? Uh, what I remember for that fight was Steve had trained quite a bit with Cajun at, at TriStar. Uh, and he came, uh, going back to what I touched on earlier, he came back saying, I don't want to wrestle with this guy. Uh, he's, I've rolled him at TriStar and he's, he's very tricky. He's caught me more times than I've caught him. Um, I, I think I can get to him with strikes so again he's got this in his head Ellis I'm like like was, if it goes to the ground it goes to the ground you'll be fine type of thing um, he was pally with this guy as well which doesn't help him and then for some weird reason fight week he'd, he'd clocked that he had a, a guy called Kenny Johnson with him as a wrestling coach so he'd done all the, the, the prep and uh, Stevie gets it in his head that he's going to wrestle him I'm like He's saying Cajun's going to wrestle me. He's definitely going to wrestle me, and I was like, "Well, that's not how he's won his last four fights. He's he's won his last four, four fights by using footwork and he's he's touching people and then moving, and then guys are running on to shots." And I was like, "He's definitely going to do that." But Stevie's like, "No, he's going to wrestle me. He's going to wrestle me because <laughs> um, he'd seen this guy." So when it when it got to it, it was a, nothing happened. In, it was a frustrating fight, like you say. Uh, nothing happened in round one at all we couldn't score that round to anybody um, I, I remain saying to him in, in the corner I was like nothing's happened there like this like absolute shite like you need to we need to go it picked up a wee bit in round two and three but again it was there wasn't much happening um, at the time I remember thinking Stevie had edged I think he Cajun had a sore jaw like Stevie landed a couple of solid punches on him Um Cajun had a, I think he got a takedown and a, like, a quick back take or something but there wasn't much in it at all uh, but I remember it was the first time I'd been in the cage with a fighter after it thinking I will definitely win and then they announced it the other way and I was like oh fuck um, when I watch it back it's it's very close Like it, it could have easily been a draw um, I, Cajun never done much at all but he definitely didn't try and wrestle he'd done exactly yeah. what, what I knew he would <laughs> Um, for, for, for the previous kind of four fights with that, that footwork and switching and frustrating and frustrating and, and Stevie just didn't go at all and when he did go he actually he's landed the punches and, and pushed the pace a wee bit but I remember sitting in the green room after it and uh, Stevie's absolutely fine and Cajun's jaws away out the side of his face and, and I was like how the fuck have we lost that fight but it's just a game again it's just a it's the, the time format and the rules. Do, do you feel as well, though, just to come back in on that one, that Stevie so much, so much got it in his head about the wrestling that it's almost prevented him from going as much as he should have? It's like he was waiting on him wrestling yeah. and it's, it's stopped him from going, which is, you can't do that. Um, yeah. I think he was also a wee bit... At that, at that point in time, where, when you get two losses in a row in the UFC... Especially at the weight classes, a lot of times it was to cut you. Um, yeah. So I think he was. He obviously had son in, in the back. His mind coming off the field a loss, but it's it's probably the most frustrating fight we've had. I know um, it still annoys him to this day, um, but it kind of is with it. As you get those fights, uh, that's exactly that. They do happen. Uh, 
And I guess that leads leads up to the next one. So uh, he went in against Ayari. Uh, now, before we talk about the actual fight itself, I, I think I interviewed Stevie for this one. There's obviously huge pressure. You've said there a lot of guys get caught after a second loss. But now Stevie's lost to him. We know the, the US here are notorious for three losses and you're out. Yeah. What was the pressure like for Stevie getting into that fight? It uh, was massive just because of the reasons that you've just said. I uh, mean, now, like, if I get beat on my way, yeah. um, even though they never said that, but I think because of the, the way Stevie started in the UFC with the stoppages, the stoppages, and then he had the Labou fight, it, it, Patrick won, then he did yeah. two big wins and, and whatever else. It was so up and down, but he basically we went into that fight with Kane Day. It, it was you need to win it wasn't a case of, it was the first fight where we didn't think like you need to stop him it was just a case of we need a win here um, and Ayari had been in with Wallhead and Darn Till before that before coming down to lightweight yeah. so he's a hard guy to finish like Darn Till didn't he finish him he beat Jim Wallhead um, and then came down to lightweight so a lot of the camp for that was pretty much just we need to make sure whatever happens, we, we were ahead on points the whole time. Um, because that fight was in Canada, I think Stevie had done uh, six weeks at home and then five weeks at TriStar. And then I flew out fight week to, to Moncton with him. Um, and Faraz uh, joined us in the corner, which was pretty cool. But um, he, got comfort- he got comfortable round one. Um, he knew that Ayari couldn't hurt him in round one. He was getting countered. Ayari was waiting. He'd done his camp at AKA as well. Um, Ayari was waiting on Stevie's left hand and and, and leading with kicks to counter and he'd done that in round one so Ayari probably edged round one um, and when he came back uh, the, the adjustments were, were pretty straightforward was not to throw the straight left to to throw a left overhand because he was getting countered off the straight left not to lead with the kicks and when he was punching just to punch in, in twos and threes instead of singles so if he does go to counter there was someone coming back so he kind of made those adjustments and kept himself safe there's a couple of times where he, he probably could have pushed for the finish a wee bit more um, but again he needed to make sure he got the win that night so he's he's been professional and went in and he won it on all the, th- all the three scorecards so it kind of took a bit of the pressure off him with the, with the, the two losses uh, Is that a part of it though there's something that you hear UFC fans or MMA fans in general saying they want to see Finishes, quick finishes, but as uh, as you move up the ladder, everything gets more difficult in terms of the guys are so highly skilled to finish each other. It's very difficult, and out with that, the pressure to win or the pressure not to lose is so high. Is that what is that what makes it so so much harder to finish fights as you move up the ladder? I once you start getting higher up the ladder, the it's more a level playing field. Everybody's everybody's better um, but there is an element of that where when that's your only your only source of income and that's how you provide for your family and stuff like that you can you sometimes kind of let your ego get in the way you sometimes yeah. have to have to be like I need to make sure I play the game here um, and, and all that matters is is the three judges like as long as you're ahead positionally or, or volume of strikes or whatever then it's just a bit it's just a bit playing the game. Um, and there's times when you have to do that. I think if you, if if you don't do that, you're you're not being professional. Like you can you, there's a lot of good fighters. You're going to speak to Jim Owls at some point on the podcast. Yeah, he, he's a guy I fought with been in the UFC for a long, long time. Um, but because he came out and he tried to punch with everybody when he was a very, very good grappler, he, he ended up getting in some wars and they get cut. It was. It, it was decision making for us for Stevie to, to win that fight on points uh, if the finish came it came but with the two losses sitting it was a, a case of we need to be smart here we need to get the win he was excellent uh, Santos was excellent he's the best he's ah, probably the best fighter I've, I've seen live that, that's right uh, or faced they, anyway because that that fight um the problem with that fight, I think a lot of people had kind of overlooked Santos almost because he'd been out for quite a while and I think a lot of people didn't look into 
his record before he fought him. How nervous were you about that fight? Yeah, I was pretty nervous. I, I actually thought he's a bit older, uh, Santos, and he'd, I think he had four years out. So I was, yeah, we, we were kind of thinking that would have been more of a factor. But I knew him for jiu jitsu. Um, he's, he's a big name in jiu jitsu circles. He's a really good jiu jitsu guy to watch in the gi. Um, and then he'd, he'd been at Nova and Yao and his striking had been getting better and better. He knocked out Kevin Lee. So again, we never got an option. Stevie was told, This is how you're fighting. Um, I, I got information for coaches later on that a lot of guys had, had turned him down not a lot of guys wanted in to do with him um, but we had a good camp for that the guy was just was frightening um, Stevie made a mistake he overreached to, I think a guy was about 6 foot 6 foot 1 and very long and good footwork and Stevie couldn't get near him the first kind of minute um, get hit with a hard body kick and then when he he's kind of went to try and get it back and overreached he's left his feet out and overreached and, and Santos has countered him put with an absolute peach a, a counter right hand over the top um, but he was he's maybe by far the best fighter we have faced as a gym he was, he was excellent so he that, he was the most he was the, the, the toughest opponent Stevie's have faced then in the yeah UFC. yeah I think uh, there's a reason why a lot of guys are ducking him. I don't know why he doesn't fight more. Um, but he's he's very, very good. Could that be why though he doesn't fight more that a lot of people don't want to don't want to fight him? Just don't want to take that challenge on? I, I, yeah, I think so. Because some of the coaches I spoke to who are guys who've got big names in that division were like, we got offered him and, and it, it's no worth it at this point and, and stuff like that. But I, I think uh, I think he's happy just teaching jiu jitsu, and then yeah. and again he's like, "I'm going to have a fight." Just his record's frightening. It's crazy that if that's the case, he just wants to teach jiu jitsu and occasionally get in. Knock out a light, knock out a, a UFC lightweight. It's, uh, yeah. <laughs> it just shows how good he is. Yeah, um, he's really good. One that I'm sure was a big relief for, for yourself and Stevie because he. The, the losses he had before it, the the name Michael Johnson uh, gets given to you. Just give me give me your reaction when they phone you about Michael Johnson. Uh, I was nervous to be to be <laughs> to be fair, <laughs> um, but again, it's that that's why we're there. We want to fight the guys. And when when Stevie gets guys like that, you're. It, it brings the best to him. There's a re- there's a reason he's beating Pearson and, and Lowe's on and then went on to beat Michael Johnson. Um, it's it's there's, there's guys that scare him, I think. Yeah. Um, and and Johnson definitely did scare the both of us. Um, we planned for that, like to see if we could get Michael Johnson tired. We, we knew he was like fast. He he actually fought excellent that night. He, he took around to feel Stevie out round one. And Stevie probably ended up just pipping around the edge, around the wee bit because of it. But when Johnson came out at the start of round two, it was it was like right, I've sussed him out, I've got him, and he went for Stevie a bit more. And he just looks fast, man. Look, looks, looks super quick. Um, and it takes Stevie a wee bit of time in that round to get up to speed with him, get his timing back, and get a read on him. And he got it kind of near the end of the round, but he definitely lost the round. And then the the last round is. He's, he's just mixed stuff up he, he never showed it he's kind of shown the takedown a couple of times earlier on just to get Johnson thinking and Johnson sprawled really well a couple of times but the last time when he, he he backed him up to the fence a wee bit more when he shot so Michael couldn't sprawl and then eventually got to the back um, which is one of his better positions and managed to sit in there um, just control him and, and damage him with strikes I think he was a wee bit I think he tried to choke him but Johnson defended it pretty well and then he, he was just happy punching him to, to, to get the round banked um, but we're speaking about it after it he's pretty sure he could have maybe finished him if he'd pushed for the choke more um, but again that was one where when it came up I was like I think we've got this I think he thought we'd got it I know yeah. Johnson kind of thought he'd got it but um, the, the judges got it right if you watch it back
obviously another guy we wanted to have a, a chat about is is Danny Henry. Um, obviously, as we've said in a previous show, Danny Henry's got a, a fight. Hopefully, it's going to happen soon. Uh, but let's talk about uh, Danny's debut. Uh, Danny debuted against uh, David Tamer. Um, talk is, uh, obviously, Danny had been the, the AFC champion before that. So talk us a wee bit about through Danny's camp for that first fight in the UFC and how the fight went. Uh, it's, it's quite similar to Stevie's. He got called up late. He actually had a broken foot. He broke his foot in training and was wearing a, like one of the big plastic boot things on the doors. When yeah. uh, we got called and asked if he, if he would take the fight. So he came in, he had to wear wrestling boots while we trained. He couldn't kick. Um, I think we had four weeks again. It's basically a case of getting him down to featherweight. Um, and then and then sparring it was quite hard for us to get sparring partners for that guy because I think the kid's about five foot six he's short powerful wee guy um, so it was similar to Stevie's like we didn't have a full camp um, but it, when the opportunity comes you have to take it so he had to take that that plastic boot hang off and he, he was worried about passing the medical even with that th- with, the, with the foot being fractured um, but it was just a case of getting him as fit as he could and then going in try to fight as close to a game plan as possible and, and getting the win and then dealing with the foot and then hopefully getting a full camp and whatever for the next one. Um, what I remember most about that fight is whenever we're in the hotel with Danny, for some weird reason we always end up getting stuck in the... We end up watching films just to pass the time. And uh, he just watched that film, The Craze, and there's a scene in it where... We're, they're in the pub and the, the, I think it's Ronnie Craig's going on about this we came here for a fucking shootout thing <laughs> I come here for a fucking shootout right a proper shootout with some proper men <laughs> <laughs> Danny, Danny kept saying this all week I think when we're getting closer to this fight and closer to this fight and if you watch the fight back the two of them are just beating the shit at each other and, uh, I remember him saying it just as we were walking out through the curtain to go into the fucking hydro um he just said it and I, I kind of burst out laughing then when he was out there I was like Jesus Christ like he get dropped and he get hurt and I was like I think I just lost my voice in the first round because it was so loud in there but he's he just does what Danny does he's just a stubborn fucker um, tough hung in there started coming back and eventually wore that guy just broke that guy's heart pretty much but um, took over and, and then eventually got the win is Danny one of your most stressful guys to corner? Um, not usually. He's, he's usually pretty cool. But, you know, Danny's a guy we don't really have a lot of uh, game plans. Eh? He's, he's different from the way we are with Stevie sometimes. It's just like, he's, he's smart, Danny. Like his, his fight IQ is very high. So basically what we do with him is we send him in there and we kind of figure it out. We, we try and yeah. it's, it's like we figure it out as it goes. But, um, that, that fight was just stressful because he get he get pinged pretty early and he had the, the, the rubber legs for a wee bit trying to get his senses back and then um, he's, he's kind of came back and, and took over but got the victory debut and obviously debut. training around a fractured foot is not not easy yep yeah. yeah. and uh, then next up now this is why I'm going to I'm going to murder this guy's name McAway David Hakeem Hakeem I can't even mind right um, so Dawoodoo Dawoodoo um, so no this was this was an impressive fight this was a highlight highlight real fight for Danny I believe he got a bonus for this one yeah he didn't he actually he got one for the first one he, never got it for the second one fight tonight no, for the first no because Paul Craig triangled the Russian guy mean. oh Ankle I will like a second left. oh <laughs> how got him was that no, obviously no for Paul getting the win, but just, I mean, that's it any should, other night, that's a bonus here. Uh, it should have been, um, considering what the Hakeem's went on today in the UFC as well. Yeah. But, um, I, he was he was a guy that scared us as well. I knew him for, for kind of Thai boxing circles. He's like a Thai boxing champion. Um, and then he'd moved to SBG in Ireland as well. So I kind of got a message for John Kavanagh saying, uh, 
a coach for Canada's messaged me asking if his fighter can do his camp ways and he said John had said aye and then he's like a week later I found out he was fighting Danny and I was like oh well so um, it was it was a weird one but it, it was a guy like, it was his UFC debut so that this was something we were wanting to capitalise on like he'd been fighting in World Series of Fighting against decent guys he was 8 and yeah. I think at the time but I was like to Danny you need to go on this guy straight away and just let him know that the, the UFC is different for World Series of Fighting and uh, he's came out and just it, it was perfect really he's faked a couple of shots landed an overhand right dropped him and then jumped on his neck as he's got up he's made a couple of wee adjustments on the grip on the neck and eventually put him to sleep but con- considering what that guy's yeah. went on today it was it was a massive one I think he's he's won four since then um, he, the guy's a very good fighter and stuff but Danny was just perfect that night we're, we're Kenny always looking for that fight as a coach and as a fighter where you just it's like an execution you just take the guy out and you get nothing back um, I mean joking with Danny after just just being like you need to retire now because you, you won't be able to it's going to be hard to match that replicate it um, we had the, the film reference for that as well we've been watching that Will Farrell film Get Hard and uh, <laughs> <laughs> there's a bit in it where uh, Kevin Hart's talking about mad dogging yeah, uh, Will Farrell's like I'm not a mad dog I'm a sad dog so. <laughs> that's a mad dog me and Danny had been going about the hotel all week saying we're going to turn that mad dog into a sad <laughs> dog and Hakeem had been doing this face at him all week when <laughs> this mean mug and a mad dog face <laughs> and then Danny's like fucking okay. like, I'm going to turn that mad dog into a sad dog uh, I'm sad dogging you Think that's a strategy that could work? No, I don't. I don't think it's a strategy that could work. Hey, listen up, everyone. I'm extremely sad. <laughs> that's perfect. And he did indeed. Uh, and then obviously Danny's Danny's last fight was against uh, Dan Ige. Uh, <laughs> just just quickly, give me your give me your thoughts on the fight itself. Uh, he got jumped on early. Um, he started slow. Ige started fast. Uh, Danny threw an Ige fake to a jab or something Danny threw a, a kind of left hook counter pulling his head out and put it right on Ige's left hook um, mm. a powerful wee guy fast very very good fighter um, and then he's and Danny's kind of been scrambling for his senses Ige's jumped on his back uh, and then got the rear naked choke so it was it was almost a year I think it was a year for Danny had done that to Hakeem in the same venue so it was like the same eyes I remember thinking like this is what it's like on the other side um, and I didn't like it but <laughs> it, it, it's, it's that level isn't it it's the, these guys are excellent and he guys again he's on the rise now this guy a lot of guys are starting yeah. to take notice of him um, and and he was a nice guy after I spoke to him and he was like I trained really hard on who Danny was dangerous and um, he's, he's a guy I'll, I'll kind of like to watch yeah. kind of moving forward type of thing yeah and uh, obviously hopefully we'll see Danny back in soon depending on how everything goes uh, but we'll just finish on that one you now yeah. obviously uh, let's say this is just a wee bonus episode for, for everybody we'll try to get as much content out as we can during these these difficult times for everybody but thanks for jumping on tonight James and uh, letting us get some stuff out to the people that enjoy the podcast. No worries, man. And obviously, let's say we'll be we'll be back again soon. And as always, just uh, pop on the YouTube channel, subscribe to the channel, and uh, follow the higher level Facebook page and uh, obviously the Instagram page as well. Cheers, everybody! Thank you.